I am Matt Williamson at Williamson NFL. How's everyone doing this fine day? So, a little bit of an odd pod today. Um, I have never done this with you guys, but I threw it out on Twitter. Hey, want to do like a mailbag pod today? What are some things that I have not touched on that you want to hear? And the response from you guys was awesome. So, maybe we'll do this throughout the off season, every so often, once a week, something like that. Because I got a lot of good questions, and I'm excited to talk about that. Now, don't take this the wrong way, but OJ Simpson passed away on Thursday, and obviously, his life, his story, is you know whatever everyone knows. But as a football player, I just wanted to throw this out there because I've said this for years. As a football player, I think Earl Campbell and OJ Simpson are maybe the two most underrated Hall of Fame-type running backs ever. And I am very aware that I am on a Steelers-Pittsburgh podcast, but I think OJ might have been the best football player in the NFL during the 1970s. And I'm very confident that he was the best offensive player in the 1970s. And again, I know where I'm living. I know where my bread is buttered. He was that good. And he was an awesome receiver well before his time. And this is not an OJ Simpson podcast. But just think about this. He was on a horrific team with no passing game. Like, even you older folks, do you even know who his quarterback was in Buffalo? I mean, so bad. He rushed. He did one of the most amazing things in NFL history. And he did it year after year. But in one season... He ran for over 2,000 yards with like 11 man boxes and no passing game. 2,000 yards in a 14 game season. 14 games. Think about that. So I'm not talking about the man, or the person. We all know that part. I'm, I am a football analyst. But you want to watch some good running back tape? <laughs> Go to YouTube and check out, check out the juice. Wow, the stride length, the power, everything. Anyway, all right, let's talk Steelers. So Michael Anderson asked me, we haven't actually seen much of Jones at left tackle. Do you think we're putting the cart before the horse a little with the assumption we can just draft the right tackle and move Jones to left? It's a great question because even in college, he didn't have low, he wasn't a five-year starter at left tackle. You know, he didn't have loads of experience. And to his credit, They threw him in at right tackle. He did it without complaints. One thing about Jones, I'll tell you, is they really like his competitiveness, his toughness. I'm not saying he's going to be the next Marquise Pouncey in that locker room, but he has some of that. He'll do whatever you want, and he'll run through a wall for you. But I also will tell you it's common knowledge in that building that he would prefer to be on the left. They want him on the left. He's better on the left. He's more comfortable there. So that doesn't mean he's going to be Jonathan Ogden, you know, and be great, but he's an immense talent and putting him on the left side gives him the best chance to succeed. No question in my mind. And I I do think you'll get more consistency and consistency wasn't exactly as bad as a rookie, to be honest with you. I mean, his highlights are better than his play after play play, you know, but I do think putting him on the left side is very much the plan. However, what if Penn State's fashion new is there and you can't believe it at 20 and he's only a left? Well, I think you'd leave Jones on the right. I mean, but I think when it comes down to it, you'd prefer Jones as a left tackle. And I would put a chip down that he is the starting left tackle on opening day. Doesn't mean he's going to be a superstar, but I do think he's very promising and that will help. Bet Online continues to be your number one source for all your basketball wagering needs, including pro and college hoops throughout the year. With up to the minute odds, stats, and trends, you can follow your favorite team's path to the playoffs with in game live betting, contests, and the best player props. Experience the world's best wagering platform anytime from your desktop or your mobile device. Head to Bet Online today to become part of the team. And remember to use our promo code BLEAV, B L E A V, for your 50% welcome bonus. On your first deposit, bet online. The game starts here.
All right, Michael Bradley asked me, would you trade up for, or who would the Steelers trade up for? Question mark. What if Rome or Alt drops to 14? Or Mitchell or Fawaga to 17? If Rome or Alt drops to 14, yes. I mean, frankly, to get from 20 to 10 would be really expensive. I mean, you go back and look at the, the Devin Bush trade. I'm not interested in that. I think we the Steelers team needs all the future picks they can, all the assets they can, all the bites at the apple they can. So I am very anti-trading up. And I mentioned 10 because I really think that's about as far as Adunze or Alt could possibly drop. And that would be a little far-fetched almost. If they start getting into 12, 13, 14, I think you at least call. I mean, they would be phenomenal additions. Now, I've said several times, and I 95% mean it, that if Latham or Fawaga is there at 20, you don't even consider trading up. You just go get them. You just run to the podium and take them. But at what point do you move up for one of those two? You know, right tackle types. The draft would really have to go against you for me. You know, like tackles would have to be falling at a more rapid rate than you even suspected. And for me to do it, it would almost have to be like a Broderick Jones move where I'm giving up like a third or a fourth to move up two or three spots just to get my guy. But a little teaser, something I'm working on now is my top 20 if I'm the Steelers. And actually, I'm going to get up to like 27. And there would have to be a huge gap between my 14th best player and 15th best player and 13 of the top my 14 are gone. You know what I mean? But I think the way this sits, almost any likely scenario, I'll be pretty comfortable sticking and picking at 20 or even trading down. Um, you know, it's true though, asked me, was trading Deontay Wise, it's a USFL receiver room outside of Pickens. You're not 100% wrong about that. And we talked about this a ton when it happened. I thought they'd get more for him if he was moved. But I think they really like Jackson a lot more than I thought. And I think at that time, at least, and I think it still holds up at least for the draft, you would rather shop in the wide receiver aisle than the cornerback aisle. And they did pick up a little bit of draft capital in the process. But I can't say I'm not worried. I mean, I thought for sure another shoe would drop. I'm not even saying that's necessarily Ayuk or Diggs. But I thought maybe Mike Williams would have been, you know, solidified by now and you'd feel a lot more comfortable going in the draft or something of that ilk. I'm sure there's things in place. You know, there's still a lot of talks. I believe, and a lot of these questions are understandably people getting nervous heading into the draft, you know, center, et cetera. I do believe, though, when it's said and done, and maybe it's an after June 1 situation, the Steelers will have a day two receiver from the draft added to this room, as well as a veteran that you guys all know, better than Tyler Boyd. I mean, uh, 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 and I don't know who that name is. That name's becoming harder to find, to be very honest with you. I have some in the back of my cranium that will probably do a whole podcast on at some point, but it's a little worrisome. Yeah. What, does that mean they would take back the Deontay Johnson trade? Like if Carolina said, hey, you want to run it back? We'll just, I'll take out my guys back. You take your guys back. I don't think so. I think they wanted them out of the building, you know, to some degree. Um, along those lines, Michael Adesso asks, what about Traylon Burks from a Tennessee trade? I don't hate it. Um, he is a big physical first round pick two years ago. He's from the picket class. Um, really raw and has not been used properly there at all. Like to me, he's a physical slot that you want after the catch, not much of a route runner, sort of by default, sort of by misevaluation, in my opinion. Tennessee has used him as an outside the numbers, traditional George Pickens type. It's not at all what he is. And I think the Steelers would make him a slot, a power slot. You probably could buy him 50 cents on the dollar. Like, I mean, he's a four-star pick two years ago. They now have Hopkins and Ridley. 
it's a deep receiver draft. Maybe Tennessee would just say, yeah, we'll draft one in the fourth round to match those two veterans. It's a new coaching staff, so maybe they would be happy to move on from him. Maybe they adore him. I don't know. Um, I wouldn't give up a ton for him, but he would be interesting. It's a good name. Uh, I'm fine with it. Uh, Mikey G735 says, off topic a little bit, Matt, but my bucket list was to sit in a war room, preferably the Steelers, during an actual draft. And he puts in parentheses, never going to happen. Question, did you have that privilege as a scout with Cleveland? And I'll be honest, I mean, that would have been my bucket list thing the first 25 years of my life. Even when I was at Pitt, I always hoped that I could like get my foot in the door, even especially after the draft, if they would have let me in the war room to see the magnets and all that stuff, you know, never happened with the Steelers. But yes, with the Browns, I did one year with the Browns. If you guys aren't aware of that, it was... We drafted Braylon Edwards in that draft, and the season I was with them was Ben's rookie year. So that was Aaron Rodgers' draft class. I mean, it was Alex Smith went first overall. That was the running back class that had the you know Ronnie Brown and Cadillac and Benson. They had three running backs that went in like the top six, which is like unheard of now. So the answer is yes and no. During the draft, draft day, I was not in the war room. That room gets pared down to just a couple people. I was right down the hall in my office. And if someone would have been like in the third round, come knocking on my office. Well, we're not sure about this corner. You scouted them. Give me answer this question for me. Okay, cool. And like late in the draft, I was on the phone with all the undrafted free agents. And <laughs> my claim to fame there is Steeler fans. You're not going to like me as much as you used to. But my claim to fame was I was responsible for getting Josh Cribbs to the Browns, you know, nearby school. We had drafted Braylon Edwards in the first round, but we've got Josh Cribbs on a um, undrafted free agency deal. You know, I was in charge of the wide receivers and he was the one I got to come, you know, we, and how that worked. I can tell you how that works real quick, too, is they gave me, I think it was 10 grand at the time in signing bonuses to sign three receivers we needed for camp. I think I gave nine grand of it to Cribs and 500 each to two other dudes I never heard of that never made the team. And then he went on to hurt the Steelers as a kick returner. My fault. Sorry. But in terms of draft prep, that was one of my favorite things I've ever done in my career. Was There was a, a, a nice stretch there where it was sun up to sun down with a break or two in between of being in the war room, building the boards listening to everyone's reports. Unfortunately, you hear things about the young men that aren't flattering. You know, oh, he's an alcoholic. He's a wife beater. He's a, you know, whatever. I mean, terrible stuff that you don't know is the media. Brutal. Let alone all the injury stuff. It's rough. But it's really eye-opening. It was really awesome. I don't think I'll ever be with the team again. Um, I love the media side of it. And so I miss, that's one thing I would really, really miss. But on terms of draft day, the people in the room are pretty narrow. I mean, it was head coach, owner, GM, especially in round one. I don't think owners involved as much in round seven. You know what I mean? But there's only going to be a couple people, maybe head of person, you know, one of the top personnel guys, something like that as well. But it was awesome. I mean, I'll be the first to admit it, it was awesome. The draft prep part was really up my alley as I bet you can imagine and um draft day was cool you know we ended up with Braylon Edwards who at the time was our number one. if we had the first pick in the draft we would have drafted Braylon Edwards and he was our th we got him in the third overall pick and one thing I will tell you that's a fact and somewhere in my attic I might still have the reports the Browns had a higher grade on Aaron Rodgers than they did Alex Smith so if they were going to take a quarterback in that draft, it would have been Aaron Rodgers. Who knows if he'd have turned out to be the same player. I mean, he wouldn't have sat behind Favre. He'd have been in a much worse situation. We were a horrible team and a horrible organization. But their grade was higher on Rodgers than it was Alex Smith. So um, stories from that are fun, and I appreciate it. We will talk again tomorrow. <laughs>